All right. Ready, Julia? Okay. Let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We ask the blessing on the reading of your word. May your Holy Spirit be our guide. May he be our teacher. Lord, uh, take me out of the way. May you teach us through your word. Your word is quick. That means it's alive, Lord. Your word is alive because you're alive, because you're a risen Savior. So we ask your blessing today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Revelation 15 today. Shortest one in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Revelation 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Seven last plagues, similar to the ten plagues of Egypt, only uh, seven, but uh, filled up with the wrath of God on a Christ-rejecting world. Now we have a time where people can come to Jesus. There'll be a time in the tribulation where people can come to Jesus, but they're going to be hunted down, they're going to be killed, they're going to be considered traitors to the new world order that will come into place. They will be considered uh, outcasts. <laughs> People will, uh, if somebody harbors someone, if they harbor one of the 144,000, Jesus said, blessed are those that give a cup of cold water in his name. And there'll be people that will do that for the 144,000, and then they will be considered the enemies of the state. And it's going to be a worldwide thing. You know, but this system isn't going to prevail. We're going to see that in here, that praise the Lord for Jesus Christ, the righteous, that he is victorious. And people still will have a choice in that time frame. It's just going to be a different time. Verse 2, and I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. I think this one kind of sums up a lot of the whole chapter today in verse 2. Uh, just for the whole spoiler, we have a sea of glass mingled with fire. These are going to be those people that God still called out unto himself that he purified and he sees in them that his own picture, that sea of glass, that they're going to come, but they're mingled with fire because they're going to have gone through the tribulation and given their life. And they got victory over the beast. Well, not by victory, some political victory, but victory by the blood of Jesus Christ. Over his image, they didn't bow down to his image over his mark they didn't take his mark that we talked about over the number of his name his <laughs> wisdom we learned that there will be those that take the number of a man 666 so many say seven's the number of perfection seven's the number of completion when god he completed he finished the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested to show us a picture of himself that he himself is the one that brings rest he didn't need to rest. He's eternal. He showed it as a pattern for us and who to look to, to look to Jesus Christ. But then it also says they stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. It's amazing because they, even though they went through all this, they came through being victorious, having their joy, still singing their song <laughs> unto the Lamb. Okay, Revelation 4, 6, if you look back. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. This is the, when the rapture of the church, a sea of glass at peace, not going through fire, but still the sea of glass. What I firmly believe in this is that we see a picture of the church of God, who he's now sanctified because they've come. 
He's given them their glorified body. Nobody's living this perfectly sanctified life now on this earth. Anybody who says that, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Okay, The only time we're going to be sanctified and he's going to see that perfect picture is when he does it before the throne of God. He does it with this group. He does it with the other group that now is there uh, before him. Uh, I think of both of these when people say that when they water ski, I'm not a water skier, but I think Diane, you've water skied, right? Mike? Yeah. Okay. No surprise. Mike can kind of do about all those things. Yeah. All right. <laughs> but I always think when they say, oh, the water was like glass, it's just calm. Well, they're, they're calm. It's not mingled with fire, but they're still both are a sea of glass because they've been brought and perfected into his image. And who does that? Not me. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be working on our sanctification here, but he still does it, okay? But many times he might point out, boy, you're not sanctified in that area, Doyle. you got to be thinking about me. you got to be reading my word. you got to be studying that. you got to get more like me here so it's less painful. But he's going to finally do all that polishing up when it comes <laughs> to getting to heaven, you know? So know that as you struggle through but we should be walking more like him every day and that should be our goal to be further sanctified in this life but again this was a picture in revelation 4 6 before the throne is the church of god it's a sea it's calm they're not going through the tribulation now we see in verse 2 of revelation 15 it's mingled with fire they had to go through the tribulation anybody who says that the church is going to go through the tribulation that is not true it doesn't mean we won't have trouble he said in this world you will have trouble but take heart for i've overcome the world and we shouldn't lose our song we shouldn't lose our song okay but here in revelation 4 6 it's his precious bride it's the jewel it's the church sanctified once it reaches heaven he sees his image it's they're redeemed by the blood but now in verse uh, 15 2 it's the sea of glass mingled with fire they're brought in still the same way we talked last week there's another flock he said there would be another flock i think we see the other flock in revelation that he's going to bring in but he's still the one going to make them into the sea like unto crystal that it's going to be into oh, his oh. image but they have to go through the fiery furnace of revelation okay but how did they get victory over the beast by his blood. Look at Revelation 12, 11. It's only by being in Christ that any have victory in any dispensation. Past, present, future, it doesn't matter. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him. We're talking about the Antichrist. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto death, but they're going to have it mingled with fire. Okay, They're going to come in. But again, back to Revelation 15, 2, they come in rejoicing. It says they have the harps of God. They're singing his praise. You know, uh, what victory do we have now in ourselves? Uh, me personally, none. Nothing without Jesus. Okay? So let's remember that the revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we always want to be reminded of that. And I try to always get that on the forefront every week so that we know. But sometimes right now, I think we lose our song. I felt like I lost my song a little bit temporarily yesterday. Just kind of had a couple of little bumps. But let's go to Philippians 4, verse 4. But happiness, I always think about happiness, uh, hap means just something you happen upon, you come upon it, and happiness is temporary, but joy is eternal. Okay? And so many, uh, in our, uh, we talk about the pursuit of happiness in America. Everyone has the, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but it's fleeting. Okay? They can pursue it. But it's fleeting. We should pursue joy. And how do you pursue joy? By being in Jesus Christ. Okay. Philippians 4 verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. 
We could sing that. That'd be great. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The, la the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And I think these tribulation saints have come through, and yes, they're in heaven now, and there's going to be rejoicing in heaven, but they never lost their song. I don't think they lost their song, and they loved not their lives unto death. And I think we can learn something. Obviously, these were books. This, this book, this scroll, was written to the churches, to be read to the churches. And that's why it needs to be preached yet in the churches today, to remind us not to lose our song when things aren't going just right, that we need to come to him, we need to look to him. Whatever is going on, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And that seems very hard, okay, at times. But sometimes we're just dealing with everyday things and little things get us off track. Um... What will these saints of God deal with, though? Lack of food? Lack of water? I mean, the water is going to be turned to wormwood, a third of it. Uh, lo loving not their lives unto death, they're going to be hated and persecuted. I mean, we might think we're hated and persecuted now, but man, compared to what they're going to face, it's going to be nothing. It's going to be worldwide. So let's all remember to rejoice. And it's going to be worldwide in the sense that there will be believers everywhere hiding and, and, and spreading God's word and doing that. And it's going to go forth. But then there will be people that will have submitted and taken the mark. And that's going to be who's in control. Okay? Uh, but what do they do? They don't lose their song. Let's not lose our song today. Okay, let's look at verse 3. What song did they sing? They had the hearts of God. So Revelation 15, 3, it says, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Let's look at the song of Moses in Exodus 15. Let's jump back to Exodus 15. There are several songs of Moses, and I'm going to look at... Uh, uh, all three of the ones mentioned in Scripture. And why? Let's remember what they were delivered from. They were under in slavery, the people of Israel, in 400 years of slavery, and they come out of that. So in Exodus 15, verse 1, okay, Genesis, Exodus, second book of the Bible, be at the front of the Bible for those of you turn it. Okay, that's why we memorize those. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. Now look who triumphed. Did they triumph? No, he did. Amen. And that's the thing. We always have to look to him. It says, the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Remember, he covered up the Egyptians with the water. Verse 2, the Lord is my strength and song. That's who we need to look to in times of struggle. I can't do anything in myself. And that's where sometimes we start to rely on ourselves, don't we? I mean, do you get in those patterns? I know I still do. And it's like, and then all of a sudden I'm like, okay, why didn't I just immediately take this to the Lord in prayer? Why didn't it take me an hour to think about it? Because we're still in our flesh and sometimes we've got to take it to the Lord in prayer. Um, so, the Lord is my strength and song, and he is become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in a habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Remember, this is the song of Moses. Okay? Pharaoh's chariots and his hosts hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains are also drowned in the Red Sea. Going back to verse 3, though, he is the one who is going to defeat the Antichrist. With his word, he's going to come back. Much as he defeated Pharaoh. Pharaoh's a picture of Satan. He's going to de defeat Satan when he comes in and dwells that man of sin. Verse 5. 
The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom as a stone. He's going to cast Satan into the pit for a thousand years. Then he's going to come back and rule and reign. And like I said before, people will say, well, the devil made me do it. Right now, people have that excuse. He's going to take that excuse away because you're, you're going to see mankind eventually rebel after a thousand years of peace and prosperity that's worldwide where the lion lays down with the lamb where he restores things the desert's going to bloom as a rose these are all things written in the bible that the desert the whole world he's going to somehow restore the creation in that sense and it's going to be like it was pre-flood i believe and people are going to live to be older and you know than they do now and he's going to restore all those things when he rules and reigns but it says, uh, but he's the one who's, who does it. He did it with Pharaoh. He did the defeating. He's going to do it again with the Antichrist. So many are into this kingdom now theology that where they think we have to bring about the kingdom of God. We can do nothing to bring about the kingdom of God. All we are called to do is plant the seed. We're supposed to bring the gospel to others. Verse 6. Thy right hand, O Lord. Who's his right hand? Who sits at his right hand? It's Jesus Christ, the righteous. Is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And he will do that one day. He did it back then. This was an actual thing. The reason they're singing, because Jesus Christ delivered them. He led them through the Red Sea. He was in the cloud. He did it before them. Pillar of fire. He led them through. Verse 7, and in greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumeth them as stubble. And he's going to do it again with the word of his mouth when he comes back. And we'll see that. We've talked about it before. After their deliverance through the Red Sea, these the same people of Israel are going to be delivered through the tribulation and brought into the millennial kingdom but we're talking about some saints that have given their life lives this week. Psalm 90, let's go there. Another song. This one is written, it's uh, written as a prayer of Moses. And you might say, well, then it's a prayer. But let's remember, psalms are songs unto God. So this is also a song. So it's a song meant in prayer. I think a lot of times when we sing, we're really talking and praying to God in the, in the song as well. So, Psalm 90. <clears throat> Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever, thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. Remember in the book of John. Kids, if you're not memorizing the book of John, you need to be looking at that. We're going to... I'll hand out some things this week when we come that you need to memorize some verses. But in the beginning was the Word. Who's the Word? It's Jesus Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Okay? He's the Creator. He was God. He's the everlasting Father, is what the Bible calls Him. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons. All can be in existence at the same time, all three are one God. Boggles the mind sometimes. I don't disagree. Okay? But it's true in Scripture. Verse 3. Thou turnest man to destruction. Sayest, return ye children of man. He's going to be saying in the time of tribulation to these people on earth, repent. And many are going to say no. <laughs> okay? For, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away with the flood. Again, this is a song of Moses. Carriest them away with the flood. They are as in a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up, and in the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath we are troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. Okay, this is another song of Moses. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32, uh, verses 3 and 4. Deuteronomy 32, I believe the whole chapter is the song of Moses. I'm just going to look at verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> but let's remember, 
He's a consuming fire. And part of this message this week, too, is about his wrath starting to, again, be poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. And he knows all their sin. And they're going to do it even more openly before him in that time. And they're going to reject him. Deuteronomy 32, 3 and 4. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. When we stand in those final judgments, remember, he sees every thought we've ever had. But every judgment he will make is just and true. And when people have rejected him, he will give them the punishment they deserve in hell. And he will be completely just in doing that. And that's why we want to share with others so they don't spend eternity in hell. Mm -hmm. So that they know they can have forgiveness because we are going to publish the name of the Lord as it says in verse 3. Ascribe greatness to our God. Praise the Father. Praise the Son for Jesus Christ's blood shed for sin. Praise the Holy Spirit. He's the rock. He's the one on which to stand. Everything else is sinking sand. We cannot stand on anything but Jesus Christ. You know, and sometimes trouble. A lot of people with sports, you know, they'll say, well, sports, it really reveals your character. And I think sports always reveals every person's sin nature. Okay? And some people rise up over the sin nature, and they're not Christians, and they can do things in sports but they somehow, but that's just a fake thing. It's not, it's temporary. It's not going to last. And there are Christians in sports, okay? And still, Christians sometimes let their sin nature come out. It reveals to them that they've still got some sin that God is dealing with. Because when things go wrong, they swear, they get upset, they don't do this. If they're not a Christian, they need, they, it should be pointing out, oh, I need Jesus Christ. But if a Christian is struggling with that, they should be like, Man, you know what? The sport is revealing that in me that I'm really still struggling in this area of the flesh and I need to confess that. So, you know, as we've been working a little bit with uh, one uh, Christian group, it's been, you know, I always think of that, that sometimes people will have that a little bit backwards that they'll say, well, sports reveals the character. I think it always reveals the sin nature. And to the Christian, they can say, okay. Man, I, I hated that they won. They beat us on the last second play. Gave it everything I got. And it still is tough. <laughs> okay? I'm not saying it's not tough. But then what does the Lord have in us? In, in our life for that reason. Why? And maybe it's to show him that even when we lose, we can lose gracefully. Or if we win, we can win gracefully. And we can help others out. And we can do those things in that right way. But... Uh, Psalm 7, verse, oh no, sorry, we're, st we're back in uh, Revelation 15 for verse 4, and then we're going to go to Psalm 7. So, Revelation 15, verse 4. <coughs> Again, you look at those songs of Moses, and they talk about judgment. They talk about fearing the Lord. We should fear the Lord. Well, then what's the next verse? When they sing the songs of Moses, all of the songs of, Ma of Moses praise God, but they also speak of his judgment. Okay? But they speak of his deliverance and his grace and his mercy. He is a God of wrath. He is a God of mercy. And he's always been that in the Old and the New Testament. I heard, I don't know how many times people are like, well, that's Old Testament. He's a, he was a God of wrath. Now he's a God of mercy. He hasn't changed. Yeah. He's the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the eternal God. He hasn't changed in any way. He's always been a God of wrath, and he's angry with the sinner. And his wrath is upon the sinner who has rejected Christ. And they need to be in Christ. And that's the only people that are going to escape his wrath. Because the rest are sinners. We're all sinners. I mean, we could put this big bubble and say we're all sinners. But then we can have this little bubble, but this bubble is going to escape his wrath because they're in Christ. Okay? 
Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? Remember, at the name of Jesus, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Who will not fear thee? Everyone. At some point, we can either choose to come to the fear of the Lord now in this lifetime and bow the knee and take him as our Lord and Savior, or people can do that in eternity where they bow the knee, but they'll be cast into hell because they never trusted him. But who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For, only, for thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. He's the only one who's holy. And now I may step on somebody who's in the Catholic Church, but if you pray a prayer that says, Holy Mary, mm -hmm. that is not biblical. Amen. Okay? Only God is holy. So if somebody hears that out there, look at this verse and you have a decision. Are you going to trust that prayer or are you going to trust Jesus Christ that this passage talks about? So Psalm 7, uh, it says, For only thou art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. He is going to rule and reign. This is speaking of his rule and reign physically on the earth. And they're going to come every year, year after year, to bring unto the Lord what is his to bring before the Lord. And one of the things uh, in Isaiah, when it says, I, and I think it's Isaiah 55, one, somebody can look it up, see if I'm right. I, I'm probably wrong, but it, oh, everyone that uh, is thirsty, come. Ye who have no money, buy and eat. And I'm just paraphrasing that one. Is that one Isaiah 55, one? And yes, the gospel is free, but in the millennial reign, he's going to give freely because people are going to bring their tithes and their offering to him. And those that are in need, he's going to feed them. But he's still the provider. <laughs> okay? Everyone that's thirsty, everyone, he will have a solution. There's no political party right now that has the solution to worldwide hunger or anything like that. It doesn't mean we shouldn't, as Christians, be involved in those organizations. But our job as Christians is to bring the gospel forth. And if we build an orphanage, we feed people, but we don't bring the gospel, we've done nothing. We have to bring the gospel. That's the number one job of the church. So, uh, Psalm 7, verse 7. Goes with this verse. All nations are going to come and worship before him. We understand his judgments are made manifest. Psalm 7, oh, verse 1, I'm sorry. I have an extra 7 there. O oh Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces when there is none to deliver. O oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, if I have delivered him that without cause is my enemy, let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. Yea, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay my honor in the dust. Now, that's pretty harsh. <laughs> you know, if we've done anything wrong, I've done plenty wrong in my life. But it also shows we should have a heart of repentance, a heart towards other people where we're not doing wrong anymore when we've come to the Lord. Uh, let's jump to verse 10. My defense is of God, which saveth the upright in the heart. God judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. I always remember Psalm 711. And I would think of the 711 stores because they had a big gulp. And I always think when you read that one, you should have a big gulp when you read that one. You know, because it's like gulp. That's tough. God judges the righteous. He's going to have a judgment of the righteous. He's going to judge everything we've done since we've come to Christ. But that's not a judgment that you can lose and go to hell. But then he is angry with the wicked every day. And so many say, well, that's Old Testament. He's, if you haven't been paying attention through Revelation, he's going to judge the wicked. Okay? I mean, that's New Testament. And it actually, in Revelation, it seems a lot harsher than anything that went on in the Old Testament. 
Because those that reject grace are going to receive a greater judgment in this time of grace than those that did it in the Old Testament under the law. But I do believe that he gives, that throughout every dispensation, he's given chances to people to come to him. And he's always had a way, he's always had a light. And anybody who wants to know God, it's been available. And he's always made it available. A lot of people are always worried, well, what about this part of the world? Okay, through time, people have rejected him, and they've gone their separate ways, and they lead their families their separate ways. And those children follow the ways of their parents, and it's the importance of learning. But I know that he's always made himself available to all generations, and his judgments are just and righteous. And I also know in this time, in the as we go through Revelation... He is going to bring the gospel to the whole world. What the church has failed to do, God's going to show, see, it's got to be me. And he's going to do it with those 144,000 witnesses. That many, I believe, will give their life. I don't know how many, if any, and it could be all, I, you know, that make it through or don't make it through. <laughs> you know, there's no number, so I'm not going to speculate. I'm just going to say that at the end, they're all standing with him like we saw last week. All right, let's uh, read verse 13. Let's pick up there. He hath also prepared, I, oh, let's, why well, skip 12? If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. So the person who's rejected the Lord, he needs to turn. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordained his arrows against the persecutors. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity, and hath conceived mischief, and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit, and digged it, and has fallen into the ditch which he made. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, in Revelation, they're going to be trying to kill the saints of God, and they're going to be the ones that fall into the ditch. It's much like Haman, when he put up the gallows for Mordecai in the book of Esther. He built these gallows, and he was hung on it himself, mm -hmm. because God's going to be the ultimate judge. Sure, there may be a temporary victory in killing the saints of God that the Antichrist has. But it's fleeting, it's temporary, and it's not eternal. Okay? And I wouldn't even call it a victory because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's right. Okay? And we saw with the two witnesses, when their time was done, then the Lord allowed them to be killed. Whatever he has for us here, he keeps us until that is done, and then he takes us home. Okay? <clears throat> but Revelation 6.10. I'll let's turn back there, and then we'll come back and finish out the rest of this book. It's only eight verses in Revelation 15, so we'll come right back to that. Revelation 6.10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Remember, the tribulation saints will be crying out to the Lord from beneath the altar, saying, How long will you not avenge us? And he's going to do it. Let's pick up in Revelation 15, verse 5. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony of heaven was opened. So this is the temple in heaven. Let's remember when they built the tabernacle down here, that was a model of what was in heaven, right? Okay? When they built Solomon's temple, it's a model, all those things. It's a model of what is in heaven. And the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen and having the breast girded with the golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. So these, what we're going to come upon next week are these bowl judgments or vials, bowls, that are poured out with God's wrath. That God's patience is running thin. <laughs> that right now those bowls are being filled with his wrath. And i got to imagine right now they've got that meniscus that, you know, when you pour a bowl full. If you don't know what a meniscus is from science class, kids, it's when you pour either a glass of water or a bowl. And the bowl, it, like, has 
tension over the top and it bubbles onto the top. Have you ever seen what I'm talking about? Go home and pour slowly, pour water into a glass. Don't make a mess in the kitchen for mom though. And pour it in a glass until you see the glass bubbling over where it's like, wait, it's got more in it than is actually full. Like when it gets to the level, you can actually pour a little bit over and it's because of the surface tension of the water and it holds it in until it comes to a point where the, it's too much and it pours over. And right now, I got to believe that God's bowl with his patience, with the iniquity of the people is filling up and it's got to be at the meniscus where it's just drop, 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 and all of a sudden the bowls are going to get poured out. And we're going to talk about those next week. So... <clears throat> Let's remember here, let's finish verse 8. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And this is in heaven that we see. And let's remember God is, our, uh, is a consuming fire. And there are several place, places in Exodus 40. There was a cloud that covered the tent of the congregation. It's verses 34 and 35. You can look it up later. It filled the tabernacle where God's presence was there. But now we're talking about God's wrath and the smoke is filling the temple because he's pouring it out on a Christ-rejecting world. People want to say, well, the New Testament, he's God of love. <laughs> he is. You're right. But he's also, if you reject him, you receive his wrath and it's what's due. Don't reject him. Put your trust in him. Trust him. Okay? Moses, it says, was not able to enter the tent of the congregation because the cloud was upon there and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Well, this is the smoke, you know, because uh, the uh, plagues are about to be poured out. In 2 Chronicles 7, it says, when Solomon had made an end of praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. His glory filled the house in 2 Chronicles 7. So this is not unprecedented that this has not happened before in that sense, but now it's all about pouring out these bowls that we're going to get into these bowl or vile judgments next week. But praise the Lord. Let's not, let's be like those saints of God and not lose our song today. So I don't know what's going on in your life right now, but... Let's not lose our song. Let's come to him in prayer. If anybody needs prayer, uh, come. Let's talk today. But let's give thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a merciful God. Lord, we know that the world is filling up the bowl, and that meniscus over the bowl has got to be ready to spill out. But you're holding it back. You're letting it even bubble up higher because... You're patient. You're long-suffering. You want people to come to repentance. You want people to come home and put their trust in Jesus and be part of your true church. So we pray for any in our midst today that haven't trusted you. If they're not sure if they're saved, that they might trust you, put their trust in you. Anyone listening online, we ask for that. Uh, that they would trust, put their trust in you. And it's just as simple as admitting they're a sinner to you and trusting you and what you did. Putting away the dead works, not thinking that they're good enough. So many think they're good enough. Well, I'm not that bad. I just need a little bit of Jesus. You need all of him or you got nothing. So we pray for any out there that need to come to salvation. We pray for family members, friends. We pray for those traveling this week. We pray for those traveling home after church for protection. We just ask your blessing on the reading of your word and we praise you for Jesus and his bloodshed for sin. And Lord, keep us this week singing your song. As a friend of mine said at work, sometimes he sits there and he can't help, but he'll be singing. And then all of a sudden he'll notice somebody looking and he'll be singing, you know, singing a song of praise and he'll notice somebody look and then he just turns back around and keeps on a singing. <laughs> so give us that joy today as we leave. Give us that joy this week. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.